Okay, that looks like my voice. Do you want to talk into the microphone to see if it picks yeah. up your voice? Can you hear me? Oh, I can see it. I can see the lines going. Oh, oh there we are. There we are. Hello. Yay, we can see the little <laughs> green lines. Hey, you and welcome. My name is Mike, and uh, here we are. We're back. Another episode of the That Chapter podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Very dark. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on, Keith? What's going on, G? It's been a while uh, for the folks at home who don't know. We mm. haven't recorded in uh, three, mm. three weeks. Two weeks? Yeah, three? feels yeah. like a long time. I feel like I'm rusty. I know, this, yeah, yeah. Uh, the last episode we recorded was when we were in your spooky attic, which for the people listening, it won't seem like any time at all. It'll just be a week in a difference, but for us, it was like three weeks ago. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Good. Yeah, yeah. we definitely did that again. It was really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I am excited to see how the video turns out when mm. I finish editing it, which I haven't started yet. <laughs> yeah, you haven't seen any ghosts pop up in the video? Not yet. Editing? No? Okay. I mean, I barely, I literally scanned through it. It looks fine. All right. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. They'll edit it later. But, uh, you know, so either it's turned out really well or... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or whatever. Um, so, yeah, Keith, what's going on with you? Um, you know, like I said last time, I seen you was in your haunted house mm-hmm. in the spooky attic. I seen the names that were carved above the thingy. Yep, yep. Uh, any any spooky tales from your house, though? Since Because, since like I said, I haven't spoken to you in like three weeks. Yeah, and I, I do have a spooky tale. Ooh. Something weird happened. And it's one I was like, no, it wasn't that's scary but okay. can't explain it sure so I work from home so I spend a lot of time like on my own the house so I was up work from home yeah. and my wife my daughter they, they were gone and I have a like a wheelie chair that I work on just like the chair you're on there right and it's like an office desk chair or whatever yeah an office desk chair yeah and just working away doing my thing and I felt very my chair was pulled ba- pulled backwards mm. like a very deliberate pullback mm. not far but it was definitely like an aggressive kind of tug backwards right and it felt like there was someone behind me that has pulled my chair back. Wow. And it kind of caught me. It was like, oh, that's for you know, it yeah. was it was weird. I, I thought it might have been like a little, the wind <laughs> the, pushed the ground. The down. wind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought it might have been like maybe like a dip in the floor or something that where like, you know, your chair might have rolled like that into. It would have happened before if that was the case. Exactly. I've been like I've been there for like a, like, we've been in the house nearly a year now. Yeah. Over here, and like my chair hasn't moved since the same spot. I tried to do it again to yeah, find yeah. the dip on the floor, move my chair around. But nothing couldn't find it again so wow. it was definitely weird I said like it wasn't very scary like, it was during the day yeah so yeah, yeah. it wasn't wild it was more of an inconvenience than yeah that. I was like for folks sake, I was like, leave I was me alone right in the middle of like writing an, an email and it was just yeah. it was rude more than anything right yeah 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 God, but, that's uh, annoying. yeah but very uh, but strange yeah, yeah very strange but yeah that, uh, par- apart from that uh, no, no nothing else that's probably yeah. the only the strangest thing that's happened since mm. but uh, yeah I'll definitely keep you updated man cause yeah yeah, no, uh, well, as somebody who's been in your haunted house, um, I didn't feel it was terribly haunted. Hmm. But then again, maybe in the dead of night. That's I'd be it. feeling something very different. That's it. Yeah, yeah. The middle of the night when they start moving around. Mm-hmm. Do you know, like, it could have worse things than ghosts. Uh, ants? Ants I think it, Yeah. Uh, I'd, full of spiders. Yeah, that would yeah. be just annoying. Mm, yeah, yeah. Like, if I had to have a choice between ants and ghosts, I'd pick ghosts every time. At the end of the day, look, listen to all the great content we're getting here. You know That's what I mean? It, yeah, yeah, yeah. We wouldn't have recorded the, the, the listener episode in your attic if your house wasn't haunted. So. In, in a different world, I'd just be talking about ants the whole time. Mm-hmm, exactly. <laughs> Not People as interesting. Be furiously tuning in, I'm sure, to listen to you talk about that kind Why of shit. Why does it keep going on about ants? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, listen, let's stop stop talking about ants and start talking about today's topic. Today's topic is the Black Mass murder. That's it, yeah. Yeah. That's Sick. fucking cool as fuck. It is, yeah. It's a bit I of... mean, what happened wasn't, but, you know. No, yeah, it's definitely got some ritualistic undertones to it. Uh, mm. It's very heavy on the church, and, yeah. It's oh, cool. all my favorite things mm. that I like to talk about. That's Religion. it. Religion. I mean, it's not re- I, mean it, I suppose the, the context or the setting is religious, but it's mm. like, you know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I kind of hate. Talk- I hate talking about religion. I hate this kind of shit. It's all because I don't know. It's just weird, and you're gonna upset people. And- yeah. Well, it's more. Uh, it's more murder than religion. It is more murder than religion. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's it. Well, here, listen, you can actually introduce it. Because, uh, again, this is a Keith special. He did the, the research for this topic. So it's definitely an interesting one. Yeah. Um, do you want to do the opening, is it? You can do the opening, yeah. For the folks at home, we're looking at Keith's notes. He's sitting across from me. He's wearing a black hoodie. <laughs> he's wearing a T-shirt, which I got in Salem. It is, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he's furiously staring and very intensely at his <laughs> laptop right at, now. At my notes. Mm. Okay, so a priest and a nun walk into a chapel. The nun is stabbed to death 31 times, and a priest nearly gets away with murder for more than 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's me slapping my knee. Now, this is not to set up for some joke. This is a tragic story of how Sister Margaret Anne was murdered by Father Gerald Robinson. 
and how gruesomely murdered she was indeed, Keith. Wow, mm-hmm. what a, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is a story of religion, satanic black magic, sick shit. Mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. lot of sick shit, actually, in this story. Uh, so, warning. Yeah, get ready for it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a doozy. It is a doozy. It is a doozy. Yeah. No, this is a pretty messed up story. So, But mm. you know what I mean? Messed up stories are, uh, are kind of uh, forte, I yes. guess. I mean, nothing I don't think will ever top either Gerald Schaefer or, uh, what's your man? Bob Berdella? Bob the, Berdella. Yeah, that's, the Kansas yeah. City Butcher guy. Still, definitely. That's still the worst that's up there. That's the worst one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was like, I mean, even my, my whole sense of humor is like, I got a pretty dark sense of humor. This mm. is part of you guys. So I tend to, that's how I deal with dark shit and sick mm-hmm. shit is kind of to just make jokes about it because it makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 easy, it's easy to make it lighthearted and fun. Tonight. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it tends to be like why I make jokes about this. But mm-hmm. that was definitely Bardello when it was like, I can't even make a joke about this. This is it was gruesome. This was pretty gruesome too. It is, yeah. But you know what? I'll try my darndest because, <laughs> hey, if making fun of something, that's what I love to Well, do. when I wrote the script, I laughed the whole way through. Yeah, so. <laughs> really <suffer. laughs> All right, so let's give it a go. Margaret Ann Paul was born on April 6, 1909 in Edgerton, Ohio. Her parents were of German heritage and devout churchgoers. Unlike most little girls, Margaret Ann always wanted to become a nun. Gee, who wants to be a nun? Do, I know, do, right? I don't know. Who's been a nun? Do you think there's many nuns these days? I don't know. Yeah. Mm, who wants to be a nun? I was an altar boy before. Yes, you were. I was, yeah, yes, for... you indeed. Yeah. I see the trauma in your eyes. <laughs> this day. I remember, yeah, I see pictures. I think I'd go to church sometimes when yeah, I was, yeah. had to go when I was a kid and you'd yeah. be there with your little dress on or whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's the name, a dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe that's what I call it. Yeah. It was great. I had a great time because back, because we went to Roman Catholic school. Mm-hmm. So there was the option to, on Tuesdays, if you signed up to be an altar boy, you got to do the Tuesday. Tuesday mass. Uh-huh. So every Tuesday we got out of school at like ten o'clock, and we didn't come, we didn't come back till about twelve by the time we finished up. Like so, so yeah. every 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 Tuesday morning for a year, I was off. Like, I had like a half day every Tuesday. I love how you say you're off. You had to do shit in a church, so it's not like uh, you're like, like at home. We could go back home and play PlayStation. Like, barely like, doing. I you're, you're, I'd rather probably spend it in a school <laughs> than in a church, <laughs> yeah. especially when you're like eight. What were you like seven, eight years old? That's yeah, but like, it was like. Uh, what was that? Yeah, yeah, about seven, seven, right? So like, but I'd leave, like, we'd leave school at like ten, and it would take us like a good fifteen min- minutes to walk to church. We'd have a bit of a laugh on the way, and then you get in, like, it was just me and the boys, you know, having a laugh. You and, you and the lads, you me, and the, me and the lads, yeah, yeah. 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 And then uh, like the mass was only boys, half an hour. Boys only, it's boys, boys boy, own, boy the boy, time, the boys club. Yeah. yeah, just the fellas. I always wanted to ring that bell though, and I, I never. I ne- Did you get to try the holy wine or whatever? I didn't. No, no. Do you think holy wine is just wine? I think the priest blesses. It's like holy water. It's kind of like it's just wine. It's yeah. 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 Do you really think it's cheap shit, or do you think it's like good, good quality, good kush? I don't know. It like never tasted it. When we had we had to pour it and stuff, but it was always already in chalice bottle. Or thing. is it grape juice? No, it was no, it was wine. It's wine. Oh, it oh yeah, no, okay. it, it was wine. Yeah. It was alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. I Probably why we I'm, didn't get to try it. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time there was like yeah, kind of like schoolboys coming out of school and she was like getting drunk on yeah. wine. Yeah, <laughs> I remember there was one time there was like uh, there was a priest and he was like he had a bit of a drinking problem, so like he would oh, yeah. glug 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 like at, during the <laughs> yeah. the thing when yeah. they're, they're drinking the wine shit. Anyway, listen, we're going way off topic. <laughs> so back to Margaret Ann, who always wanted to become a nun. Uh, likely influenced by her two sisters who were sisters of the mercy order therefore i just answered i could have read another sentence and i would have answered my own question (laughs) her upbringing was very humble her family had no running water electricity or indoor plumbing so she was certainly well prepared for the simple religious life hey listen you start off with nothing you'll never be disappointed that's it yeah yeah so after high school she spent a year at a retreat center working her way up through the ranks Man, it's like the military to shit. First as a postulant, then as a novice, soaking up all she could about religious life and the mercy order. Following that, she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Toledo's DeSales College. Then, between 1930 and 1933, she made her initial and then final vows. During this time, if it wasn't enough, she also started nurses training and got her or an registered nurses degree. Sister Margaret Ann had a highly successful career as a... How do you mark how successful a nun's career is? I don't... She got all full marks. God yeah, gave her... Yeah. Jesus said, hey, look at you. He gave her a big old, big old tick. You could like collect all the cards or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> she was holding several supervisory and executive roles at various mercy hospitals in Ohio. So then, now we're getting to the crime of the century. Mm-hmm. In 1971, Sister Margaret Ann briefly 
thought about retirement, but instead she decided to take on the responsibility of sacristan at the Chapel of Mercy Hospital. Unfortunately, this is where she would eventually suffer a violent and horrific death with quite a lot of links to Black Mass and Satanism. You know, it's funny, kind of a, kind of like a spoiler, but going ahead, I, for, when I was first reading, I was like, oh, no, Satanism angle is bullshit. And then the more you get into it, you're like, oh, it's... No, it's very real. Oh, it's very real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, big, big I was like, oh, yeah. he's, just trying to, he's just trying to be like Edgelord or something. Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, no. No, he went for it. Yeah, yeah. this is good. This, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> it gets dark. <laughs> yeah, it, gets dark. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> so on the morning of April 5th, 1980, the day before Easter, and also the day before her birthday... 71-year-old Sister Margaret Ann began her day in the wee hours at 5.30 a.m. She went through her normal morning routine and then got dressed in her traditional Sisters of Mercy blue smock dress and white long-sleeved blouse, which was a habit of her. That is such a key joke. I can't <laughs> believe you kept that in your notes. I was so proud of that joke. I know. I know. <laughs> Folks, if you're laughing, you can thank you. It's a classic. <laughs> it's definitely a classic key. <laughs> So, once dressed, she headed downstairs to the sisters' dining area in the cafeteria for a spot of breakfast and a bit of a chat with the other nuns, who I assume were all getting very excited for some chocolate Easter eggs. Nothing a nun loves more than some good old chocolatey eggs. Yeah, I don't know what to talk about, so I assume that's what they were talking about. Hey, listen, I don't know what else to talk about. Was <laughs> that, do you get Easter eggs? Uh, like, still? Yeah. No? Uh, me neither. I never really, well, I, I never really was an Easter egg guy. I always wanted, uh, there was this, it's like a, kin- do you know the, the big Kinder Eggs? Mm-hmm. And they came with like a big toy and I always wanted it, ah. but never got it. It was just always, it was too, it was too lush for us, mm. too expensive, so I never got and it. And now you as a fully grown man, you're den- denying yourself. I bought it for my daughter, <laughs> for, 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 for this season, so like I get to like live through her now opening no, the Kinder Egg. very good, very yes. good. So I'm very excited to try that. So at 6.50 a.m., I'd like a year you're going to steal from her. Hey, look what I got you for me. <laughs> yeah. At around 6.50 a.m., after finishing her brekkie, she picked up some cleaning clothes and a container of incense from the supply closet and headed to the sacristy in the chapel. For those of you who don't know, and I actually didn't until I had read this right before, a sacristy is a room in the church where the priest prepares for a service and it also contains religious things like the chalice, the altar linens, holy oils. It's essentially, as you, as you say, it's the locker room where the priest, he warms up the old cannon, you know, for, for the mass, eh? Out to back, doing stretches, jumping mm, jacks. Limbering up, just, yeah. yeah, yeah warm up the voice. Iron. Me, 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 mo. Yeah. yeah. Sister Margaret Ann entered the sacristy at around 7 a.m., but little did anyone know, this would be the last time we would see her, anyone would see her alive. <laughs> Good reaction. <laughs> 45 minutes later, Sister Madeline Murray, the chapel's organist, arrived to say her morning prayers before preparing the music and helping Sister Margaret Ann for the evening, the later evening mass service. After chatting with the big old guy up in the sky, she strolled over to the organ and she started flipping through her sheet music. But... Sister Madeline Marie wasn't sure about a particular song for this particular service. She figured it was best to check with the priest. So, she headed to the sacristy to give him a ring. However, upon entering the poorly lit sacristy, she spotted what she initially mistook for a CPR dummy on the floor. While it wasn't unusual for Mercy Hospital to have one, it was a hospital after all, it would you know, completely be completely out of place to find one in the chapel sacristy. On closer inspection, to her absolute horror, she quickly realized that this was the corpse of Sister Margaret Anne. As Sister Madeline Marie's eyes adjusted to the light, she was able to take more of the crime scene in. Sister Margaret Anne's face was completely swollen, and there was a mark of blood on her forehead. The nun's habit was pulled up near her breasts, and her underwear had been pulled down to her ankles. The body was positioned so that the arms were down by her sides and her legs were straight and close together. It appeared that the body had been had been posed as, as some kind of some kind of ritual. After she overcame her initial shock, Sister Madeline Marie ran out of the sacristy screaming that Sister Margaret Ann had been raped and murdered. Shortly after, the Toledo Police Department received a call at around 8.30 a.m. And several detectives and an evidence technician arrived at Mercy Hospital to conduct their investigation and process the crime scene. The autopsy concluded that the cause of death was 31 stab wounds to the left side of the face, neck, and chests. And there was also evidence of strangulation, which is like, that's, um, 
hey, listen, full marks for trying, you know, mm, <laughs> when yeah, it comes yeah. to trying to kill somebody. And days would pass by, and the police were they were unable to find any substantial evidence as to who could have who could have done this. No fingerprints, no footprints, no fibers, hair, uh, nor a murder weapon was found at the scene. However, the one thing the police were convinced was that the victim knew her killer. They believed that a stranger would not have killed the sister in such a violent manner. There was no signs of a robbery gone wrong, and there was no evidence of male penetration either, so she hadn't actually been sexually assaulted, it was just made to look that way. This type of crime must have been performed by somebody who had a very strong vendetta against the victim, and even the place that the murder happened in, the sacristy. Like, mm. who would he, most people wouldn't even think of going in there, it's a very secluded place. Yeah, yeah. Like, it was, it was such a vicious crime, mm-hmm. and they, like, they really, they set out to, to harm them. Indeed they did, Keith. They, oh, they did. Oh, they did. Then came a break in the case. See, one of the housekeepers told detectives about a heated argument she had witnessed between Sister Margaret Ann, our victim, and Father Gerald Robinson on Good Friday, which was the day before she was killed. This was a turning point in the case, and detectives set out to question Father Gerald Robinson. Mm. He as well, like Father Robinson, um, he was definitely acting suspicious Mm. on that morning as well. He's a little bit sus. Oh, As big the kids time. say. The kids say? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're down with the sus. kids. Yeah. Sus, yeah. yeah. He was definitely acting sus because at the time when the alarm was sounded that she was murdered, like everyone just came running. It was like an alarm was sent off, it was sent off around the hospital and he was just up in his room. Yeah. Um, where, like obviously he'd killed her, as we'll find out. And then he just went back up to his room, but they were like trying to call him down. He's like, Ugh. and mm-hmm. then eventually, like after a while of trying to get him, he finally came down because they were trying to give her last rights as well. Yeah, I mean, so so she was killed. Like this is at the Order of Mercy Hospital, mm. but they also lived there. The nuns yeah. and the priests also lived yeah. like on the hospital grounds. Yeah, it was kind of like they lived on campus. Type yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. okay. So it's kind of like a university college. So it's like a campus place yeah, like, where it's like they all live there. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, he just was an arse. He was kind of like they were like she she was killed. So so some happened. He's like, How about yeah. no? Yeah. So definitely sound like bit as sus as you said. Yeah. Huge fan of the whole like. Well, nobody will suspect me if I don't give a shit. <laughs> if so. I don't do anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I guess who was Father Gerald Robinson? So, Gerald Robinson, he was born on April 14th, 1938 in Toledo. Toledo, Ohio. That's right. Mm -hmm. His mother had immigrated from Poland and his father was of German descent. Robinson attended St. Mary's Preparatory High School as a prestigious institution known for training Polish-American boys aspiring to become Catholic priests. The school's mission statement was to provide deserving young men the moral guidance, discipline and education necessary to become Christian gentlemen, scholars and men of service and leadership for the world. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, I guess... That's quite a statement. That's it. I guess uh, Robinson, he was sick that day and yeah. missed the whole yeah. explanation. After high school, Robinson, he studied at S.S. Cyril and Methodist Seminary for four years and was ordained a priest in 1964. Robinson was... He was often described as having a moody, introverted and unpredictable nature. Which is, a.k.a. he's a bit of a dickhead. Yeah, every, you know, every, everything you'd expect of a priest. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, moody, introverted, unpredictable. It's like <laughs> one thing you want for, like, the person who's supposed to, like... Be there for the parish or the whatever. The needy and the sick. Like, nah, yeah. Nah, nah. Oh, fuck this. So there were also a few instances of sudden transfers from one parish to another and a couple of unexplained demotions, which always raises a few eyebrows when the Catholic mm, Church does this. Yes, the old demotion. We know what he was up mm. to. Well, let's, let's move him around. Yeah. So between <laughs> Exactly. So between 1968 and 1978, he faced accusations of ritual abuse involving two girls. One of these girls, she came forward in 2003, but unfortunately there wasn't enough evidence to, to substantiate the claim. There was also a report suggesting that he was a member of a group connected to another ritual abuse of a female. Its members called themselves the Sisters of Assumed Mary, or Sam. They were priests who did what they called nun drag. They would dress up in nun's clothing and give each other nun's names. Uh, they'll come up a little later in the case uh, yeah because yeah I feel like it needs a bit more explanation but yeah it's a bit we'll come back yeah. to that because right now it sounds like sisters have assumed uh, Mary just like oh they're having a bit of fun they're dressing mm. up as nuns and calling each other like nuns names it's like oh no they did a lot more than that they were like this wasn't just like a little yeah. hanging out no, no, it's, doing a little bit of dress up this is the they were into some sick ass it's got some very very dark ones at all so yeah 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 man this is fucked up this case is like really fucked up <laughs> Uh, ah, anyway, swiftly moving on. So the chain of events leading to Sister Margaret Ann's murder began on April 4th, 1980, 
when she had a disagreement with Father Robinson. On Good Friday, Father Robinson conducted Mass in the chapel with Sister Margaret Ann among the small congregation. For reasons unknown, Father Robinson decided to shorten the service without consulting anyone else, and this upset Sister Margaret Ann, who confronted him about it. That, that, that service was way too short. It's it like, it, it has really, to be at least two hours long. It really, really pissed her off, this. Wow. Like, she felt like they were, like, depriving God. Of, like, I think, like, Easter is... I could, I could be wrong saying this, but I think it's, like, higher than Christmas for, like, priests and nuns and people within the religion. Because it's when Jesus comes back from the dead. And, yeah. So, like, it's probably the most important. It's, like, the big... It's, like, the Super Bowl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Super Bowl for, I don't know, maybe all Christians, maybe just Catholics. I don't know. I've, I don't... I don't... I literally know nothing about religion. I, I'm, not, I'm not, not sure. Like, I was not by it. I'm not too sure. But <laughs> I know I like Christmas because I got, I got presents. But yeah, that's all I give a shit about. I, I think maybe, like, devout Christians. Easter could be up there, the top, the tip of the top. Hey, listen, Easter eggs... That's good. That does give it a nudge. So anyway, Sister Margaret Ann was really pissed off that he kind of uh, freaking sped through service and she wasn't having it. She was not having it at all. And this wasn't the first time the two had clashed over administrative and religious matters. On this occasion, as Sister Margaret Ann berated him, Father Robinson, he remained silent, staring at her with disdain before walking off. Robinson, see, he's one of them fellas who just didn't like being told what to do. Especially not by a woman. Especially not by a <laughs> bitch. <laughs> he did not like that. So that was the final straw. Honestly, um, to go to the chase, that's literally it. That's why he uh, murdered her. Yeah. Because she just kind of started shouting at him. There's nothing else to it. Oh, that's because it. he yeah. did. He speed ran a church service. Yeah, he just didn't like someone. She was old and but he, she had less authority than him, and she mm. didn't like him talk. And she was like, she was like a typical nun. She mm. like, she was very, she was very devout, but she was very strict. Uh, she, was, she was, she was very nice and pleasant, but extremely strict. And like, these are the rules. You follow the rules, and you don't right. deviate off the rules. And that's why she really settled into this like administration role uh, mm. within the sacristy. Like, it really suited her down to the ground. But like, if you if you went off script, she fucking hated it. And yeah, she, she ate the head off you. Not something he was used to either. Yeah. All right. So Robinson, he was seething with anger after that, after his latest confrontation with Sister Margaret Ann, and he was just fed up with her, as you said, her behavior, her bullshit. So he planned to hatch, or he hatched a plan to kill her. <laughs> Robinson was familiar with the routine, so at around 7 a.m. on April 5th, he quietly entered the chapel knowing Sister Margaret Ann would be alone. He picked up a long white cloth near the altar and silently crept into the sacristy. There... He snuck up behind Sister Margaret Ann, wrapped the cloth around her neck, and began to pull and twist it. In the process, he broke the uh, bone in her neck. <laughs> if there's a word I can't pronounce, I'm skipping it. <laughs> Hyoid bone in her neck. Okay. Hyoid bone. And caused the blood vessels in her eyes and face to burst. He then laid her lifeless body on the floor, covered her with the altar cloth, and placed an upside-down crucifix over her heart, using it as a guide for what was to come. He took out a letter opener he had brought with him and stabbed it into her body around the edges of the crucifix. Essentially, he was tracing a bloody crucifix yeah. over her body. But he, he, he wanted to get it right. Yeah. yeah. He then stabbed her repeatedly in the face, neck, and chest a total of 31 times. And finally, in an act of blasphemy and humiliation, he pulled up her habit over her bra, pulled her underwear down, spread her legs, and, uh, well, with the same crucifix he used as a stabbing template, he poked, you know. Yeah. 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 You know where it's gone. After he was done, he straightened her legs, straightened her arms out by her side, and positioned her bloody and partially naked body, hoping it would be seen as a ritualistic message to honor Satan. One last horrible detail to all of this was that Robinson was actually the priest that presided over Sister Margaret Ann's funeral. Really, really fucking dark. Yeah. And it's weird, like, mm -hmm. there's parts where I was I was wondering if, like, he was literally doing this just to make it seem like it was ritualistic. Yeah. Or, but then he went really far with it. Mm -hmm. To, yeah. like, instead of just kind of making it look like it, like, he went ahead and did it. Yeah, it's like, you're not, now you're, this isn't like a fake Facsimile of it. You're yeah. actually. This is actually like. This is an act of actually. Hell yeah, see, You know, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. You may as well. You're literally. I mean, you're literally murdering a person. So yeah. I don't yeah, really, yeah. That, that <laughs> seems like pretty uh, devilish, delightfully devilish. So it's definitely. It's one reoccurring theme in this case is how ritualistic it was. Um, the Black Mass is. It's like the ultimate ceremony for a true Satanist aiming to gain magical powers. It's it's a blasphemous ritual where a nude woman serves as an altar with her vagina acting as the sanctuary or sacred space. 
all good so far. Yeah, I'm down. <laughs> Typically, a real host or sometimes a crucifix is stolen from a Catholic church and inserted into the woman while participants, they chant distorted prayers mixed with obscenities, curses against Jesus and praise Satan. The whole thing usually ends with the fake priest getting it on with the altar. Nice. Or the woman. Hell yeah. So the Black Mass, is it's like a mix of pagan beliefs using the Mass for a personal gain, especially in the bedroom, and making fun of Christian rituals. It's, it's like a twisted version of Catholic Mass and often involves stuff like torture and sacrifice. It's basically, you take Christian Mass and completely reverse it. Do the opposite. Mm. Um, it's worth keeping in mind that there are two kinds of Satanists. So first you've got the ones who are, they're all about Satan. They believe he actually exists and sacrificing animals and even kids to win his favour. They're all about the Black Mass action and like this is like their main event. Then you've got the other crew. They're like, uh, nah, Satan's just a symbol. And they seem more as a representation of all our human cravings and desires. So instead of sacrificing animals and stuff, they just go out there and indulge in all sorts of sins and pleasure and all that good stuff. So basically you've got the, the hardcore believers on one side and folks who see Satan as more more of a mascot for their bad behaviour on mm-hmm. the other. Uh, yeah, we actually visited the Satanic Temple when we were in Salem. And I don't know about you, but I had a lovely time. And they definitely seem to fall into the latter category. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, good cover, Keith. Yeah, just yeah. Stop telling about the black mass and how we all had sex with the woman who's an altar. <laughs> oh, is this recording? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, but there is, there's also the Church of Satan that was founded by Anton LaVey in the 1960s, which is separate from the Satanic Temple. Yeah, I, was, I got confused between all this shit. It's like... Yeah, uh, well, this one, this the Church of Satan, so they do believe in magic. Okay. Um, but and one thing they also believe is men who enjoy blue cheese uh, dressing are homosexual. <laughs> it's, 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 it's weird, like, the, the, the thought process behind Wait, it is... Wait, yeah, what's the thought process behind that? So, it's... Okay, so it's pretty disgusting. So, if you like blue cheese dressing, it basically You're means... You, yeah, it's because huh. it's got a similar odour to... To a dick? Jock straps. Oh, to jock straps? Okay, yeah, well. Yeah. So uh, if you enjoy that smell, you enjoy... You enjoy yeah. sucking a cock. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> wow, okay. They, hey, listen, that's you can't go wrong with that logic. You look, know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to tell you that the church Satan has some wild views, but... That sounds like, that's 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 like one of the ones I can get by. <laughs> listen, you did come in here with smelling of blue cheese, Keith. <laughs> I see you wolf shit that shit down. So if you like blue cheese, you've, you've learned some yourself yeah, today. Yeah, that's it. Hey. <laughs> So, thanks to the person who witnessed the altercation between Father Gerald Robinson and Sister Margaret Ann the day before the murder, the police were now on to Robinson, having been told of a little, little fight or rooney they had had. Two weeks after the murder, detectives searched Robinson's room at Mercy Hospital, where they found a dagger-type letter opener in his desk drawer. The shape of the dagger matched the description of the murder weapon provided by the coroner. The Is weapon, it- though... Sorry? Sorry, I was going to say, like... It's, Did you inter a fucking inter... <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> oh, I told you, Ben, you're ordering me, Keith. And eating blue cheese at the same time, I dare you. <laughs> My wife loves when you say that on the podcast. <laughs> it does that... Uh, <laughs> Did you interrupt me again? <laughs> <laughs> Cracks up every time. Um, I was just going to say that the the like the like murder is really distinct. It's like yeah. uh, if you kind of picture like a pirate sword. It's like curved. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. So it was pretty... Bad odd. Ass. It was pretty easy to kind of match up. Okay. Cool. Um, So the weapon, though, unfortunately, it had been cleaned, not just a little bit, cleaned thoroughly, my friends. However, using a chemical to test for blood, they they did manage to find one small spot at the base of the blade. So Robinson was brought in for questioning by the cops. During the interrogation, it came as no surprise to the detectives that Robinson, he denied, he denied committing the murder. Can you believe this fucking asshole? (laughs) Denied it? (laughs) Fucking balls on this kid? However, what was surprising was his claim that he knew who done it. Who done oh, did it? Ooh. He stated that Sister Margaret Ann's murderer confessed to him during a confession. He did the whole, you know, if he confess your sins, it's a get out of jail free card. Mm. This was a shocking revelation as Robinson had violated one of the Catholic Church's cardinal rules. A priest must never disclose anything about a confession, and such a violation is punishable by automatic excommunication, like medieval style. Yeah. But is there not such a thing? You know the way it's like it with therapists and psychiatrists mm. and all that shit? It's like, it's a doctor-patient confidentiality, but if you talk about something illegal, they have to say it to the police. Do priests have the same kind of, like, obligation to the law? No, that's what I thought, and I looked it up after. And oh, they don't? No, if you, if you go to a priest and say, do you murder someone, they... 
like they'll push you towards go to the police. Yeah, they're trying to get you to confess, but <laughs> proper confess, not just yeah. kind of bullshit them. Yeah, but yeah, wow. no, they can't they can't tell anyone. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, hey, yeah. folks, <laughs> folks, do you got something on your mind? Don't go to the guffs, go to a priest. Yeah. So you can get it off your mind, and they won't tell anyone. That's yeah. great. <laughs> well, this guy did though. <laughs> oh yeah, or well, did he? Mm. Ooh. <laughs> So, yeah, man, excommunication, huh? That sounds like medieval style, mm, like yeah. uh, Crusader. That's that's shit's whack. What does excommunication mean? You just can't go to church anymore? You're like banned? I think you just get your pink slip, you get fired. Oh. You're out of here. Oh, Don't okay. go back. I thought it'd be something cooler. Anyway. It'd be cool if it was like a whole like trial or something. Yeah, like a whole thing. Yeah. yeah. With yeah. like, you know, everyone has robes and like pitchforks and like mm-hmm. fire. Ow. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that sentence for You just got excommunicated right there, my friend. <laughs> So the police, obviously very eager to find out more details about this mystery man who confessed, they pressed Robinson for more details. Who's the one who done did it? However, under the pressure of his own lie, Robinson vomited into his own hands and admitted he just made up the story because he was exhausted and just wanted to go home. By the end of the interrogation, the police noted in their report, Truthfulness could not be verified. Deception was indicated on relevant questions concerning the murder of Sister Margaret Ann. I love that I just let him go. They're like, all right, well. You know. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's so guilty. Like, yeah. And he, like, it was almost immediately where he was like, I know who did it. And it's like, oh, yeah, who? <laughs> 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 and so it seemed like the police had got Robinson cornered. And it was only a matter of time before he got tangled up in his own lies and they managed to get a confession out of him. After all, the priest, he had motive, he had opportunity, and he had means. However, weeks would turn into months and the priest was never charged after police cited insufficient evidence. Eventually, after two years, the case went cold. There was a lot of speculation about a possible cover-up during the investigation to protect the sanctity of the church, because if there's one thing we know about the Catholic Church, they are very honest people Mm -hmm. who will never cover up horrific acts done by their own. Mm. And, of course, the police chief, a devout Catholic, was, of course, also going to cover... Did you ever see that movie Spotlight? No, I haven't. Uh, it's very good. It's about the Boston Globe expose of all the Catholic church crimes in Boston. Oh, cool. Essentially, it's the same shit. Right, okay, cool. So the police chief, who was very religious, he publicly asserted that priests and nuns were next to God, and apparently there was pressure to not charge Gerald Robinson. In fact, during Father Robinson's interrogation, the police chief, along with a representative of the Diocese of Toledo and an attorney for Mercy Hospital, They all intervened. After spending 10 minutes with the priest, they escorted Robinson out of the building, which is literally a scene in Spotlight where the priest, like, they come in and escort, just walk him out. Leaving the two interrogating detectives just standing there, wondering what the hell, where they were taking their prime suspect. And so, after the case went cold, it would take another 25 years before it would heat back up again. Father Robinson, in the meantime, resumed his duties at Mercy Hospital. I think that's the crazy thing, the whole thing, where he just, like, kept on doing mm. in, in the same area. Yeah, go back well. to the sacristy where yeah. he brutally murdered a woman. Yeah, and, like, there was rumors floating around. Because mm-hmm. people had suspicions. They kinda, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, they kind of knew. But yeah. no one could be done, like. So, the reopening of Sister Margaret Ann's homicide investigation didn't start uh, with DNA findings or even a tip. It began with a separate claim against the Toledo Catholic Diocese, unrelated to the nun's death but which also implicated Father Gerald Robinson. So the Catholic Church had come under fire in the early 2000s over rampant claims of abuse at the hands of priests. Among these claims was a 41-year-old woman who wrote a letter to the Toledo Diocese in 2003, saying that she had been subjected to ritualised sex acts by members of the clergy from the city. Her request was simple. She wanted the diocese to pay more than $50,000 in counselling costs she incurred as an alleged victim of clerical sex abuse. She said that she'd been a victim of ritualistic sexual abuse by a group of priests. She claimed that they gathered in church basements and rectories in cult-like ceremonies, where children were molested and ordered to watch other youngsters being wow, abused. that's so... Frivy. You know what's insane about all this shit? Is that, like, that's literally the kind of stuff people accuse, like, Satanists are doing, you uh, know, no, in basements, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. Uh, this kind of stuff, like, these yeah. evil secret societies mm. of, like, Hamid Pizza or, like, molesting kids, and it's like, no, the church was doing, like, the literally thing that, it's wild. Yeah, shit. yeah, it's crazy. So, it's believed that this group, they call themselves the Sisters of Assumed Mary, so who we were talking about earlier mm-hmm. on, the ones who dressed up in Nundrak. In her letter, which was later passed to the police, the woman named Father Gerald Robinson as one of her abusers. 
Police, they were unable to link any ritual abuse to Father Robinson. However, it was enough to reopen the murder case Mm -hmm. for Sister Margaret Ann. Yeah. So after the case was reopened, the first step was to examine the stored evidence. Two items in particular caught their attention. The dagger letter opener and the altar cloth with a significant blood stain. One of the primary challenges in reopening the case was the disappearance of some Toledo Police Department reports related to Father Robinson, which, as you can imagine, further raised suspicions of a cover-up that some reports just magically vanished. The Forensics and Crime Scene Unit determined that the bloodstain on the altar cloth, a transfer pattern, matched the curve and shape of the tip of the letter opener's blade. Additionally, they found other consistencies between parts of the letter opener, bloodstains, and puncture holes in the altar cloth. And so, on May 20th, 2004, the remains of Sister Margaret Ann were also exhumed and went through a second autopsy. The pathologist overseeing this stated that in her opinion, the weapon in question, a dagger letter opener, caused the stabbing wounds. After conducting numerous interviews and forensic analyses, Father Robinson was arrested on an aggravated murder charge on April 23rd, 2004, almost 24 years to the day after the crime occurred. While Father Robinson was being led away, a brief search of his home was conducted, revealing a large cardboard box in his bedroom containing hundreds of photographs of corpses in coffins dating back over several years. Years. Why was he taking pictures of dead people? That's oh, fucked up. Know. Yeah, yeah. In his bookcase, detectives also found a book entitled The Occult, which was published before the murder. The book contained several underlined parts, his favorite passages <laughs> that he just had to <laughs> memorize, including one passage in particular that sent a shiver down the detective's spines. It dealt with a black mass in which an innocent becomes an altar while torture, sexual abuse, and even murder are used for satanic empowerment. This is literally a priest who's a hardcore Satanist. Yeah, like, yeah. this is wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried to find a book. I couldn't find it. Damn, I, I want to read that shit. It's really hard to find these occult books. Damn. Yeah, you have to go to those Wink Wink bookstores. Mm. Where are you? Where are I know, you? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> the Toledo Diocese no longer seemed to have Robinson's back, banning him from priestly duties and refusing to cover his legal costs after his arrest but the news of a beloved priest facing jail that shook Toledo, the city of Toledo, like a storm. And his loyal followers rallied to raise the $200,000 bail and ship in for his legal fees. I mean, it's like, you think that if the church itself, the diocese, doesn't have his back, he's probably definitely done something wrong, Mm. no matter how religious you are, you know. But hey, listen, these people uh, decided to chip in their fun books and they got fucked. (laughs) (laughs) The trial lasted three weeks and featured a total of 41 witnesses, with 30 testifying for the prosecution and 11 for the defense. During the prosecution's opening statement, they informed the panel that they wouldn't be presenting a motive. Instead, they aimed to prove that a sword-shaped letter opener belonging to the defendant, Gerald Robinson, was used in Sister Margaret Ann's brutal murder. They also emphasized that the defendant had repeatedly lied during the investigation, (laughs) stating Father Robinson denied ever having a key to the sacristy, which obviously even sounds bullshit because he was the priest. Of course he would have a key to the sacristy. Why why wouldn't he? He even claimed that someone else had confessed to doing the killing, and when pressed on the matter, he admitted no that he made it up that wasn't true at all. The prosecutor laid out the crime's details in a thorough, professional, and scientific manner, while Father Robinson, now 68 years of age, in his priest's collar, remained unemotional. One of the first witnesses called by the prosecution was 79-year-old Sister Phyllis Ann. She was one of the first to find the body, and was asked to describe her first impression. The nun said, quote, The horror! I think it was the weirdness of it and that she needed to be saved! And then the afterthought, why the ritualistic kind of layout of a dead body? She continued on saying, I remember its position was so neat and so different. I told him it was ritualistic. She was lying in the center of the floor and I saw no blood. If I remember correctly, her arms were straight, her legs were straight. And all her clothes from probably her brassiere all the way down rolled down to her feet. People don't usually die very straight. Terry Cousineau of the Toledo Police Department's Scientific Investigations Unit was also brought in to testify. 
During his two hour testimony, he put on a visual show for the jury, bringing out the 10 foot long blood stained altar cloth and encouraged members of the jury to have, have a go yourself. You take a walk, take a walk around it while he described in detail the pattern of the numerous stab holes, kind of like a macabre guided tour. Hmm. He explained that there were nine holes which took the shape of an inverted cross. He said, not only did it fit the form of a cross, the symmetry and precision of it would suggest to me that something was used as a template to stab around. Initially, when he laid out the cloth, there was like, there was like 18 holes. Mm -hmm. And he's like, but then when we fold it over, it makes a cross. <gasps> so it's like, dun, dun, yeah. Dun. <laughs> yeah. that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Showman. I like yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was quite the entertainer. Yeah. Deputy Coroner Dr. Diane Scala Barnett was next to testify for the prosecution. She was the successor to the pathologist who originally conducted the victim's autopsy. And she had 7,000 autopsies uh, in her own career under her belt. So she was, she was mm. really long in the tooth when it comes to the L um, autopsaroonies. She knew she was done. Indeed she did. She told the jury that Sister Margaret Ann had probably been choked from behind with cloth material because of the nun's necklace and cross, you know, that had made an impression on her skin. The impression, this is kind of, I don't know, ironic. Um, so the impression from Sister Margaret Ann's necklace, you know, it was so tight against her neck that it embedded in her own skin. And the impression from the necklace in her skin read... I am a Catholic. Please call a priest. <laughs> that's like the darkest detail. Yeah. When I read it, I was like, that can't be real. But that's yeah, it's wild. so dark. Well, you, I have nothing to say to that. <laughs> like, that's just insane. You couldn't write this shit. The doctor went on to describe the autopsy of the victim's remains in 2004 after they exhumed the body. She said, believe it or not, 24 years later, you can still see many of the stab wounds in the actual skin and soft tissue. She continued on to say that the letter opener belonging to the priest was a perfect fit for the stab wounds on the victim. Her conclusion was that this weapon, the letter opener, caused these injuries or a weapon exactly like this. Finally, Father Jeffrey Grob, associate canonical vicar for the Archdiocese of Chicago and an expert in exorcism and other Catholic rituals. Sorry, I can't even speak. I'm so excited. Like, this, this guy, he sounds like a superhero. He took the, to the stand to testify. When the prosecution asked him to point out some of the ritualistic aspects of the crime, he said, Where does one begin? <laughs> oh, where do I start? Yeah. Jeez. This is like pretty hardcore. This, uh, this should be a... Uh, this is like The Exorcist. The sequel mm, to The Exorcist. Yeah, or yeah. One of those movies. Mm, yeah, cool. One of those uh, Catholic superhero movies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. Conjuring or something. <laughs> he mentioned how, according to the church, a nun is seen as a virgin married to God. Leaving Sister Margaret Ann naked, the killer was in essence, defiling the bride of Christ. He went on to explain that messing with what's holy and pure is a common thing in satanic worship. You take innocence and you destroy it or you mock it. Regarding the upside down cross, Rob clarified that it's used in satanic ceremonies as a way to disrespect what's sacred. He also speculated that the bloody semicircle on the nun's forehead could indicate that the murderer performed a twisted version of the Catholic sacrament of last rites. Ooh, mm -hmm. wow. It's a reversal, he said. Normally, what should be a good Catholic person going to meet God, getting anointed, it's now all of a sudden mocked. She is anointed with her own blood. Mm, the old switcheroo. The defense brought in just 11 witnesses, mostly ex-cops from the 80s. <laughs> it was actually a move that the prosecution had been counting on strategically. Later, the prosecution clarified, we felt that if we didn't call them, the defense would, and that would give us an advantage. For when I call a witness, I can only use direct questioning and not any leading questions. But if they call a witness when I cross-examine them, I can use leading questions. It's pretty smart. Yeah, but I mean, in fairness, the whole trial was pretty circumstantial, though. Like, it was all based mm. on the knife. And, I mean, he's not the only person with that kind of letter opener. Knife. Yeah, yeah. Like, they didn't have... Any DNA. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they didn't yeah. have DNA. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there was, like, it was a pretty circumstantial case yeah. built against them for something that was like 25 years ago. Mm. Yeah. Actually, you know, I think he's innocent. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I actually think he's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm convinced myself. He's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the Sidonic shoes and the black mask and fucking rocks. He's like a, he's like a fucking uh, rock star. <laughs> In closing arguments, the prosecution used another tactical strategy by downplaying the idea that the nun was killed as an offering of human sacrifice to Satan, as this may have been a hard pill for some jurors to swallow. They said, quote, Is this some kind of satanic cult killing? No. Is this some ritualistic black mass? No. Sorry to disappoint. 
This case is about perhaps the most common scenario there is for a homicide. A man got very angry at a woman and the woman died. The only thing that is different is that the man wore a white collar and the woman wore a habit. They then went on to state that the inverted cross, exposing the nun, uh, the apparent anointing on her forehead with blood, it was all a bastardized version of the last rites as a way to degrade her, specifically to mock her, to humiliate her down to the lowest point he possibly could. It wasn't really about religion, it was about her specifically. Hmm. It took the jury only six and a half hours of deliberation to find Father Robinson guilty, marking the first time in American history that a Catholic priest was convicted of murdering a nun. Robinson was sentenced to a mandatory term of 15 years to life in prison. Despite numerous court filings highlighting the lack of evidence against him for this murder, and there is a lot, it is a circumstantial case. Uh, Gerald Robinson has never been granted an appeal, and eight years after being sentenced and convicted, he died in July 2014 after suffering a heart attack after being moved to an Ohio Corrections Hospital. Now, was the heart attack caused by Satan? Mm. That's a question, which we may never know the answer to, but I say yes. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, I guess, like, throughout this podcast episode, you may have been listening and thinking to yourself, I've heard a very similar story to this before, and you'd be correct. Good for you. There is a documentary on Netflix called The Keepers, which has striking similarities to this case. Uh, Both slain nuns, decades of unanswered questions, allegations of cover-up by authorities in the staunch Catholic community and a priest at the centre of it all. However, in in the case of The Keepers and Father A. Joseph Moscow, no sexual abuse nor murder charges were ever brought against him. Uh, A judge, he refused to reopen the case years later since the statute of limitations had passed and Moscow uh, passed away in 2001. There is a number of allegations against Father uh, Mascal. Sorry, Ma- Ma- Mascal? Mascal? Who the fuck him? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who cares how his name's pronounced? <laughs> this guy. Yeah, this uh, guy. And he was removed from uh, the priestly ministry in Baltimore in 1994. However, the Archdiocese, they continued to provide financial support to Mascal right up until his death. I, uh, so The Keepers, I tried to watch it on Netflix and I think I made it like two episodes and I had to turn it off. Mm. It's just literally like people. And I was then sexually abused here. And yeah, then yeah. I was sexually abused here. And yeah, then he yeah. did it. And then they did it together. I was like, yeah. I couldn't watch it. I was yeah. like, I, I don't know. What, like, I've kind of covered This isn't funny. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, this is not funny at all. Uh, when it comes to, like, obviously true crime is like, what I do for like, mm. my life. But I, when it comes to that kind of shit, I just can't. It's, yeah, it's... I just can't watch it. It's just fucked up. No, I agree. That's it's, too, it's, it's too heavy. Yeah, it's really, really heavy. Mm. So uh, I never finished The Keepers because it was way too fucking dark. Mm. Yeah. Um, so spoiler alert uh, Father Maskell did it (laughs) now I don't need to watch it so great Um, so yeah listen that is the mystery of the Black Mass Murder which wasn't actually a Black Mass Murder but I'm calling the episode Black Mass Murder because it sounds fucking cool if you clicked on it you probably clicked on it because of that Black Black Mass Murder (laughs) gotcha gotcha (laughs) click it (laughs) so yeah uh, also Keith you did all the research for this but uh, I will say that you want to give a shout out to the book Shocking Cases from Dr. Henry Lee's Forensic Files, written by Dr. Henry Lee uh, himself, uh, which you claim was an excellent resource. Yeah, great resource, great read. Uh, definitely, I'd give it give it a goo. Give it a goo. All right. Well, you know what? I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Listen, folks, thanks so much for uh, listening. I hope you enjoyed this old episode of the That Trapper podcast. Things got pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. Bit of a religious. Maybe we should go have a bit of a pray. We can <laughs> pray together. Yeah. We all go have a pray, eat some blue cheese you know <laughs> have a good time you know um but yeah here listen you know guys you know the drill a uh, new episode of the that chapter podcast is at every single manana monday manana so uh please check it out and uh, check out you know the videos on the that chapter channel are out every tuesday and almost every friday so yeah keith uh you want to give your final throw your final thought at the wall see if yeah. it sticks it's definitely, definitely a wild story. Um, I hope that the Sister Act franchise comes out with a third movie based on this good. story. Ooh, That'd yeah, be good. Hell I, yeah. I always felt that the Sister Act movies needed more undertones of satanic. Yes. Ritualistic behavior. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Fully agree. Mm. Fully agree. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg gets beaten to death and sex <laughs> yeah. in the third one. <laughs> but then they all sing about it. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's they're cool. having a good time. <laughs> all right. Uh, here, listen. We'll end it there. See ya. Later. Oh, As big the kids time. say. The kids say? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're down with the kids. Sus. Yeah. Sus. Yeah. yeah. What else did he say? 
That's all uh, I know. I don't know. Uh, no cap. No cap. For real, yeah. for real. For real, yeah. No riz, that thing? Is that, what does that mean? I don't know. I am so out of touch. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I, I don't talk to anybody below the age of like 35. <laughs>